You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Father Paul reminds us that the hope in Scripture is not for us, but for the following generations. I am delighted to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. So to come back to this Adam, it's a mountain that is very treacherous for us because it's the mountain of the judge. What did God do on the mountain? He gave his people his rules on the basis of which he would judge them. Now, if this far-fetched? No, because already in one of the two classic names of the Mount of the Commandments, we have the name Sinai, But the other one, which is technically more important, it is mentioned at the beginning of Deuteronomy, is Mount Horeb. Horeb doesn't mean anything in English except the name of few villages in some of the states in North America. It doesn't help me. Horeb is from the root from which we have Hereb, which is the sword. Very early you have that sound in Genesis 3 where the Lord God assigned a cherub that had a hereb in his hand. Very holy ground. It's not that simplistic the way we make it. That's why we prefer always Mount Sinai. You have Mount Sinai Hospital. I never heard, perhaps there is, but Mount Horeb Hospital doesn't seem to sound nice. Especially if some of the people know Hebrew. It's like you're going there to be cut in half with the sword at the hospital. I don't care. What I care about is that the sound in Hebrew is so. that ultimately this is the sound of judgment where the teaching is delivered. And let me quote you that famous passage that we have in two places, in Isaiah chapter 2 and in Micah chapter 4. This repetition is very important. Okay? But I'll read you the text from Isaiah so that we won't repeat You have it in chapter 2, very early in chapter 2. To introduce the rest of chapter 2, which is unbearable. Where God's glory is paralleled by the word God's terror. And I spoke about this several times. But let's go to the beginning of the chapter. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. You're not going up to uh, throw at him the two censers of the archdeacons in the OCA. No, he doesn't need that. He's going to talk and you're going to follow. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
Okay? The law and the word of the Lord are in total parallelism. He doesn't send you hallmark cards. He tells you what he wants you to do. And most of the people stop here because if they push it, they are going to fall under the claw of Father Paul's teaching. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples. And notice how Horeb comes into the picture. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Remember, with the city, you have the walls and the defense and the armament and so on. But no, the walls shall be torn down. By whom? By the teaching of God. So that the people would just live on the land that will give them their lehem. And with the lehem, we are already linked to the bread of life, which is God's teaching. Okay. I fear always when I do my postings because somehow I am imagining that my hearers are going to be touched by and appreciate my theology. And that's what I dislike about teaching. The trouble is not in my teaching, the trouble is in my hearers. And nowadays, that's what people are taught. Postmodernism. That we decide ultimately the meaning of any text. In other words, what Father Paul is saying, he can say whatever he wants, the way God said whatever he wanted. But who cares? We decide. At least in the past, there was a we, even in the Protestant tradition. They used to have meetings and then produce one creed. But now, forget about the we. It's the I. Everyone decides. And who are you to tell me? So please, I can only beg you, not for my sake, but for the sake of your children, not only yours. Again, you are done with. Read Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They are addressed to the people of Jerusalem to tell them, you're done with. So the hope is for the following generations, not this generation. Even in the New Testament you have this. I would like to make two extra comments about the name Oholibama in verse 18. Just because, interestingly, it is used in Ezekiel, where Jerusalem is referred to as Ohola, and then Samaria as Oholiba. And clearly, they are a reference to this Oholibama. Now, the trickiness of Oholibama, uh, trickiness, I mean, it reflects again this interest of Scripture. Watch out not to make of a tent which is Ohel. Remember in the previous chapter where we heard that Jacob built his tent beyond the Migdal, the tower. And here, this name, as found in Genesis, combines the Ohel and the Bama, whose plural is Bamot, which is the day is something that is high, like the Matseba, Esteli. And if you don't know Hebrew, you are going just to remember Oholibama and probably in North America called the newly founded village in Utah, Oholibama. Why? To make it sound that it's scriptural. 
but that's not the way things go. One more thing, we had it earlier in verse 11, but it is repeated. When something is repeated, it's very important. We have in 34, the land of the Temanites, and Teman means south, and this is again interesting for the mountain of the Lord being in the south, and thus in the Arabian desert, technically. This was Sinai, is part of the Arabian desert. It is the southern part of the Syro Arabian desert, of which I speak again and again and again. And the last verse, these are the chiefs of Adam, the heads of Adam, which means the name of the fathers of the clans, according to their dwelling places. Interesting. Where they dwell, where they live. This is from the root Yashab. Moshe bought in the land of their possession. Here we have a word that means technically possession when compared to the other two which reflect Erdem. But here again, watch out for possession. I'm always dreading this translation. Because the root Ahaz is, for those who know Greek, is like the root Lamvanu, Lamvanin, which is troublesome because sometimes you translate it as receive and sometimes you translate it as take. The same thing in Hebrew applies to lakah. So, if you stress the take, it turns into possession. But if you stress the receive, you are stressing the connotation of something that was given to you. Not you took, I mean, let me give you an example. For instance, when you pluck a fruit from the tree, you have the impression that you are taking it. But if you are taking something I'm given to you, I am giving to you, then you are receiving it. But let me go back to the tree since I was brought up in the Middle East, and I cannot forget that. When you pluck the fruit, you are still taking something that the tree is giving you. It's not the apple you found in your pocket or on the shelf in the store. No, it's always granted to you, and hence the prayer of thanksgiving always before we eat, as the Catholics and the Protestants do, unlike what the Orthodox do. They first bless, and only after having been satisfied, listen to our prayer at the end, we thank the Lord because He filled our stomach. I mean, that's absolutely silly. That's why the Orthodox, it's impossible to convince them that the gathering on Sunday is a gathering about the Word of God that is handed to you as the bread of life. But you know, Orthodox, they can stand their priests, so they don't come only after the reading, but after the sermon. And they rush into communion. And notice in English, you take communion. I know that in the text it says receive, but that's how you feel it. That's disastrous. But, 
some Orthodox priests learn, and against the rubrics, they postpone their sermon until after communion. Smart, huh? Not bad at all. You should try it, Father Mark. Actually, Father Mark does it most of the time. Anyway, anyway. Luckily, he doesn't begin his sermon by saying, forget about communion now, listen to me. He doesn't say it, but this is how it sounds. In other words, what you have in your stomach is not going to help you. Kiss! You have to listen to the teaching. And that's what I try to do when I covered the last two chapters. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.